Hello, my name is Craig Madden. I'm a proud Bundjalung Gadigal man from the Eora Nation. I'm here at Sydney University on Gadigal land. Jinyura Gadigal, this land is Gadigal. It is customary for Aboriginal people to invite guests or visitors onto our land or country. It's a custom that we've been doing for thousands of years. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. To any visitors from any other nation or country, to all our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 clans which make up the Euro Nation. It's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Hawke River to the north, the Nepean River to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Within the confines of those mighty rivers lie the Eora Nation, and the land of the Gadigal people that we stand on are one of the 29 clans of that nation. So on behalf of our Gadigal mob, I'd like to say, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the University of Sydney. I'm standing on Gadigal country, where the Gadai people have lived, have loved, and have educated and exchanged knowledge with others across this great nation of ours for tens of thousands of years. The University of Sydney's campuses and facilities are on the ancestral lands of peoples who have loved and known and nourished this land since the very beginning of time. For thousands of generations, they've shared knowledge, they've exchanged learning and understood how it is to be here in this wonderful place that today we call Australia. If you have a look around the campus, you'll see some remarkable places. Some of those places are buildings like our quadrangle. But that quadrangle tells a different story. Many people look at it and see it as the height of European endeavour. Well, that quadrangle, that building that hosts the Great Hall, was built out of sandstone that was quarried on Gadigal and Wongal country, with timber felled from Bundjalung country to the north and mortar that was made from lime and shells that was found on site at this place. Our place is full of stories woven together and revealing the many, many, many histories of Australia's first peoples. All of our facilities sit on the ancestral lands of Aboriginal people. There is not a part of Australia that is not known, loved and nourished by Aboriginal peoples of this land since time began. The university stands on Durrett land in Camden, Wongal country in Lisbon, Gamilaroi country in Narrabri, Wiradjuri country in Dubbo, and all the way to Bundjalung country in Lismore and Gagadu country in Kakadu. Our staff, students, alumni continue the tradition of teaching and learning upon these lands proudly. As a community, we come together as one Sydney, but many peoples. Yamakara. Yama. Jinguwala. Warama. Yadama. Welcome. Welcome to the University of Sydney. Yama Gamarada. Hello and welcome to Speak Out for Yarbin 2021. My name is Ken Zulamovsky and I'm your host and moderator for today's session. I'm a Cubby Cubby descendant from Southeast Queensland, um, born on a Wabakal country and moved to the land of the Gadigal to work in uh, community mental health with the Aboriginal Medical Service. Um, I'm the CEO and Managing Director of Gamarada Universal Indigenous Resources, um, most known for its work in community healing and cultural leadership and our community program, which started in 2006 and reached the milestone of 626 weeks this Monday evening. Um, I'm also a honorary doctor here at the University of Sydney. And today I'm joined with a very humble and wise panel um, and also a very high calibre uh, lineup of um, experience and intellectuals and healers and advocates and, uh, and much more. And uh, very soon we're going to um, begin a conversation around love and what that means 
for the panel and, uh, and how, we, how we understand love in the current environment of COVID and um, what it means for our mobs celebrating uh, Survival Day around the nation. And a special hello, hello to um, our watchers, our audience, uh, international audience, and uh, all of our communities around the country. Uh, our first panelist uh, is William, and we're going to ask William to introduce himself right now. William. Thanks, Ken. Um, your name, your mob, please, and a little bit of background on how you came to be here today on the panel. Sure. Uh, so um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge country uh, and pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge you all here today and all the mob um, at home who are joining us. Uh, so I'm William Trullen. I'm the CEO of Black Aboriginal Corporation, which is a newly established, uh, well, not newly, about two, uh, 18 months in, an organisation to support our LGBTQ plus First Nations community, uh, particularly here in New South Wales, but looking at how do we support nationally. Um, I'm here today to talk about what does love mean to uh, my family and my community, and particularly what does it mean to be a part of a minority within a minority, and how, um, how that impacts and how we love. Um, and also hopefully be able to share some of my insights and stories based on my profession, um, outside of all my multiple hats that I wear uh, within the business space as well. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, actually, I probably should have said I, I'm, I'm an Akumaru Anawan man, born and raised out in Western Sydney where my family were resettled as a part of the resettlement. Uh, so my grandparents bought a house in 1972, I believe, and have been there ever since. My grandma, who still lives in that house, we lost our pop dish uh, late last year, but my nan still lives in the house and we've, and we've kept her at home and, uh, and we look after her at home. And so I have a real sense of connection to community out in Western Sydney. But I reside now here in Bidjigal country out in Coogee and have this real sense of affinity to this mob in here in Sydney where I now live and work and do a majority of my work. So that's a bit of me. Excellent, thank you, William. Thanks and that again. sounds like extraordinarily valuable work for the communities, particularly the communities of Sydney, where we know a lot of our LB, LBGTQI plus we'll get the communities. Right by um, the end today, Ken. <laughs> where they come to, they come to for you know sense of community. They come from around the country. They come from regional towns. They come from places that are not so uh, friendly. Yeah. Um, and they come to find community and safety here. So we'll be interested to hear more about that stuff from you. And our next panelist. Professor Jacqueline Troy. Well, um, it's great to be here and great to be talking about love on a day which, um, for me, if it wasn't for the great love between all our peoples in our communities, we wouldn't be here, I think. And um, we're here on Gadigal country where um, actually there was a lot of love shown to the British when they invaded. Um, because I think, first of all, people didn't think they were invading. They were just turning up and um, we showed them hospitality, the Gadigal mob showed them hospitality and the rest of the Sydney mobs did so. And we did down in my country later on. Um, I'm from the Snowy Mountains where Narugu, Naya Jaki, Naya Namichi Mitong, I am of this Nyamich clan within the Narugu nation of the Snowy Mountains in southeastern Australia. Um, I work and live in Sydney. Uh, I work on Gadigal country here at Sydney University directing Indigenous research. And um, I live across the harbour on Gamaray, Gamaray country. And in Canberra where my family lives and I spend as much time as I can down there, I live on Nunawal country. And um, my great passion is to see our languages continue. And I'd like everyone to love our languages. So I guess that's one of my my important missions in life, yeah. Thank you, Jackie. You have an extraordinary gift um, of, to be, of language to be able to empower so many others that are looking for that right, right at this particular time in, in history at a time when languages are emerging and culture is emerging quite mm. strongly, so thank you for that. Um, our next guest on the panel is uh, Uncle Pastor Ray Minicon. Uncle Ray, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Well, it's uh, also, like Jackie said, this is a, a really important day for all of us. And uh, people are out there looking at trying to change the date. And I guess um, I'd like to see people change their hearts on a day like this. Because I think if they change their hearts, we'll have a change of date. And a change of ways in which we can uh, learn to appreciate and respect each other. Uh, for myself, I'm, I'm uh, 
like Ken said here, uh, I'm from the Cubby Cubby or Cubby Cubby people in southeast Queensland around the Glasshouse Mountains area, particularly a little place called Bobble Mountains. That's who I am on my uh, father's side. And on my mother's side, I'm Gurengurang, which is uh, just north of Bundaberg. And uh, I can take you to the spot where my great, great, great grandfather lies buried there on a piece of land that belongs to our family, has been in our family under the British uh, regime for the last 110 years, but uh, on my mother's side anyways, it's been there since time immemorial. Actually, just down the road from where uh, that country is, my grandfather's country or my great-great-grandfather's country is the town of 1770. That's where we made Cook lose his anchor there, <laughs> way back. And the town of 1770 still stands there today. And uh, I also have, uh, on my father's side there, um, connections back to Ambram Island in particular. That's where my grandfather, on my father's grandfather, was taken from that particular island, brought over here to help build the sugar industry. And today we're having a sugar fest again down here in uh, uh, Pyramont just to make sure that we don't lose that story. This is the story of slavery in this country here. So I'm also a descendant of a slave, uh, both on my father's side as well as on my mother's side. My father was taken from Ambram Island, West An Ambram in particular. Actually, my name comes from there, Minicon comes from that particular country there. And also on my uh, my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side, he, wa he was taken from Pentecost Island, brought over here. And the Stanley ship, or the ship called Stanley, to build the sugar industry as well. So I have those incredible um, connections to both South Sea Islander people, as well as to my own Aboriginal people here in this country. It's a bit Thanks, Uncle Ray. Yeah, obviously have an extraordinary uh, history, uh, experience and wisdom to share with us. And um, I guess, I guess uh, really, where to start? Uh, where to start on that? Um, kind of overwhelming when you think about um, your entire life span, uh, career, and number of projects that you've been involved in, and um, um, family, uh, the history and the advocacy and it's just quite extraordinary. Um, and you mentioned uh, ties to the, uh, the sugar industry in Queensland and the, the lineage back to Vanuatu and the, the Kanaka slave trade. And I understand this morning down at uh, Parama Park, there is the Sugar Fest happening. That's correct. I understand you were there before you came here today. Um, and I guess that's uh, another option for any listeners or any audience if they're looking for something to do afterwards, head down, head down there and uh, support that that event as well. Um, today's topic, love, is um, an unusual topic to be uh, facilitating a panel on. I don't think I've had experience facilitating a panel on love before. Um, I don't think anybody else probably has had that experience. Uh, it's a kind of a tangible thing. It's, it's an intangible thing. It's a bit of an abstract thing. It, it means many things to different people. And um, even the language, the word love, uh, means uh, means things to us in a Western context in English, um, but in other nations and other cultures, we know there are other words and other meanings associated with this idea of of love, um, and we hope to explore some of that during the during the panel um, with the panelists today. And uh, I have a few questions for you. Um, we're going to begin with uh, William. So the question I have to begin the conversation, William, for you, is how important was starting black and what are some of the key messages you would like to put out there for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, LGBTQ plus community? And how can we relate that to Survival Day? You look, it's an interesting question when I kind of got it because I had to reflect on, you know, almost two years ago when we started the conversation. And look, it's probably worth just acknowledging the establishment of black as an Aboriginal corporation is not a new idea. It's not something that we've created. It's something that we've inherited by our warriors and our leaders who have come before us. So we used our intellect, which we were being privileged to get because of our generation of getting access to schools. So, well, how do we action that and what does that mean? And, you know, and for me, you mentioned a comment before, Ken, about um, 
young people, people coming from rural remote communities. And for me, that was one of the biggest reasons why I said to my inner circle, like, we have to do something about this. So we've got young kids, um, older people coming to Sydney to find a safe space, and there wasn't one for them. And I just knew I had to first check my own privileges and understand that I come as a white passing black fellow and understand what my role was in that. And it was after Mardi Gras a couple of years ago that I just got, you know, together with a couple of my brains trust and just said, well, what do you mob think? You know, what does this look like? And from that, it just really grew organically. And, you know, and for me, it was that young kid I met on Oxford Street one night at, you know, he was 18 years old. It was one o'clock in the morning. I'd been to a show, a drag show, and I was, you know, I had a really great night. And here he is on drugs selling himself because he had no safe space to come. And I thought, what are we doing? And, you know, that for me, it was a real, you know, or shit moment to say, well, have we, I have to use my privileges and use my intellect now saying, well, let's action this and let's get to a space where we can actually support and foster and, and, um, and nurture um, our sometimes forgotten community members. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was really the driving force behind Black. And like I said, this isn't a new idea. We've had people who've been doing this fight or fighting this fight for a really long time that I just want to acknowledge that, you know, we, we, we see them and we know who they are. Um, and it was, you know, us taking it to the next stage of saying, well, let's, you know, socialise, or let's, sorry, let's immobilise and strategise around how do we get to a space that we as queer black fellas are speaking for ourselves and not being spoken for. And that was the kind of real movement to why we started Black and got it to where it is today. Yeah, right. That's, uh, that's quite an inspiring journey of yours. And um, those experiences were shocking and compelling enough for you to want to take action. Mm. But not, not everybody who, who experiences that, that or, or sees that, witnesses that, will actually take action, will actually you know, be compelled strong enough to, to do something about it. So you've actually taken that leadership role. What is it within you that, can, where do you find that, that drive that, you know, that direction, that initiative, that energy. It takes a titanic amount of energy to build an organisation and hold a space and advocate in a very difficult space. Mm. You know, it's not like you're selling, what's something easy to sell? Lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like you're selling, you know? Um, yeah. you're, you're advocating for something that's quite, uh, there's a lot of stigma around it. Yeah. There's uh, some shame around it. It's, um, it's a topic that pe certain people would like to avoid. Um, it's a topic that some people would like to um, imagine that doesn't exist mm. um, and suppress it. So it's quite a difficult, challenging space, you know? So it's, and it would be that every day. Where do you get the energy from? Where do you get the drive from? What, where do you find it within yourself? Mm, look, it's a good question, actually. And I, you know, I have, it's only now you've said I've had to reflect back on it. And I just, you know, I think about the topic we're talking about today and the idea of love. Like, I grew up in a household that, it wasn't until much later on that I realised what love was for my family. You know, I grew up in a household where my pop, you know, was grumpy old Ken and, you know, he had his ways and was stuck in his way. And, you know, I always thought to myself, like, my family's really hard. It wasn't until in the last couple of years when he got sick that I realised that everything they were doing was a teaching mechanism, it was a tool, mm. and it was always enshrined in love, right? So regardless of how hard it might have been or how complex or... Um, how at times I thought it was coming from a place of anger and all the rest of it. It's now that I realise that it wasn't, and it's that that I think drives me to do what I do. And I realise, like, I, I, I've been fortunate. Like, I grew up within my family and within my kinship, and, you know, I, I know who my family is, and, and there was this sense that if I don't carry some type of legacy over, I'm not doing justice to my family, mm. right? And that's kind of, for me, is what's always been the driving force. And, you know, and I think, this idea of love comes, it's, it's layered, it's complex and it's multifaceted and it doesn't necessarily always have to come from a place of nurturing either, I don't think. And for me, that's what this was. This, this, isn't a, this is a really hard space mm -hmm. and it is a really complex space, but I have to take it with a grain of salt and understand that we're doing this because we want to see the betterment for our people and we want to see mm -hmm. accessibility for our mob. And for me, I, it, all, it all comes back to this idea of what love is. I don't, I don't love doing this job. Mm -hmm. you know, I love the outcomes it gets. Mm -hmm. But it's always really complex and hard. I always have to keep in you know, the front of my mind about, well, these are, these are lessons I learned from my family. There's really hard lessons that I thought yeah. weren't enshrined in love that I now yeah. realise that it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's a really, 
you know, and it was much later on in my life that I've realized that, and it was with my pop's passing last year that I've, you know, I've come to realize all those hard lessons were always enshrined in love, which give me the fight to go and do what I do with Black mm -hmm. and give me the energy because, like you said, Ken, it's hard, it's not easy. We don't get funding when we, mm -hmm. I volunteer my time. It's not like we're out here, yeah. you know, doing it for, you know, money, we're doing it because we want to see our people, see we're doing it for the love of our community and we're doing it for the love of our culture, saying, well, mm. it's, we have to foster and support because I'm coming from a place of um, privilege, which some of my mob aren't and some of our community aren't. And that's yeah. my driving force behind it. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and listening to your answers, you know, I couldn't help but feel a sense of compassion to think about you as a youngster growing up in a household where there was a you know, kind of stoic kind of um, personality type. Your, your father or your grandfather, um, that kind of tough love, you know? Um, and then later on when you're an adult, you realize it was coming from love and they meant well, but hey, you know, you've got to, sometimes it's damaging, sometimes you've got some injuries as a result of that, right? Um, but that has, you've taken those, those lessons and you've taken that training and, and, and that character that you've formed and you've, that's where you get your strength, that's where you get your um, ability to uh, negotiate the challenges, right? you're, you're tough, you're strong. Um, but underneath there, there's a lot of compassion and empathy because you understand the suffering that's happening out there mm. for those people that are missing out on the nurturing and the, the love in a healthy way as well. Yeah. It's okay to have a bit of tough love, but you've got to have the right amount of healthy, nurturing love at the same time, right? Otherwise, you just get all tough and that doesn't work out for some people. Yeah, exactly. Um, so has hashtag respect, and you, you also uh, do a lot of volunteering mm. as part of the role. Yeah. All of it. All of it. All of it. Yeah. So like, you know, we're a non-funded organisation, and you know, and a shout out to my board and the people who support us and to get us where we are because we're an all Aboriginal board as well. And they volunteer their time. Other than one of our board members, we're all part of the Rainbow community. So. You know, this isn't me, just me. This is a collective of people and a collective of community and a, and a community response to it. So this is, you know, and also it's also about our partnerships and who we collaborate with. So as, as an organisation that is really new in all of our essence, we've achieved a hell of a lot and that's based on relationships and based on volunteers and that comes from a place of love, comes from a place of wanting to see our community succeed and coming from a place of wanting to support and foster and, 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 and build the resilience. Well, not even build, sorry, it's restore resilience. Mm. or restore capacity of our community, because I think capacity was taken away yeah. um, through colonial history and today, and we'll probably talk about it in a moment, but yeah. you know, for me, it's about well, how do we restore capacity within our community yeah. and what does that then mean in that, you know, mm. so yeah. Yeah, wonderful. We could continue this conversation for hours and hours. Yes. Um, we've only got a little limited amount of time here and we've got so much else to explore, um, but we might return back to some of those themes as well, particularly around the cultural values around reciprocity and taking responsibility and integrity. Mm. Yeah. Um, so thank you, William. And our next panelist is Professor Jackie, Jacqueline Troy. Jackie, please. I've got a, <laughs> Jackie, I've got a question for you. Yep. So Jacqueline, how is your love of language and speaking in language an act of self-love and an act of love for the whole community? Well, um, I think it was Nelson Mandela who said that if you speak to a person, I think he said man, but I'll say person, in their own language, um, you're speaking to their heart. Um, and we in the sort of Western world um, and in English think of the heart as the place where love resides, um, which I guess is one of the things that I love about language. Uh, what is a heart to some to one group of people, um, and the I guess the soul and the spirit and this kind of intangible love thing is to another group of people simply a heart, <laughs> a physical heart that keeps your body going. Um, so in languages, concepts like love um, don't necessarily translate very well across languages. I've had the privilege of living in Mexico and speaking Spanish there and um, also knowing something about the local Chichimeca language. Um, I was around people who showed a lot of <clears throat> open sort of, um, I guess you could say, people talk about Latin and Latin lovers, you know, that there's this sort of 
wonderful vibrancy about Sorry, people who come. Sorry, I got Ricky Martin just came to mind. <laughs> yeah, well, I had my own Ricky Martin, so... Um, but, you know, there was this sort of um, a sense that um, people could admire each other and um, be much more open about how they felt about um, how people not only looked but were, you know, there was a sort of open love in some senses that we associate with being in the Latin world. Um, I've also lived in Japan where it's, it's very, very different, um, much more, um, I guess, private and um, constrained. In Japan, everything is a tension between public and personal responsibility. Giri and ninja, they say, and in Japanese, you don't say, I love you, you say, I see you, um, and aishitemasu. And I remember thinking, um, with my, having gone from my Latin love to my <laughs> Japanese love, um, how different the experience was. Um, but it was no less um, compassion and love in, which is a kind of universal feeling between people. Um, and I'm boringly heterosexual, I hate to say. My daughter who, well, <laughs> I don't know if I should be talking out <laughs> but, you know, which is an issue, isn't it? How do you talk about um, other people and their sense of love and, mm. and engagement with other people? So, you know, there are cultures within cultures. So um, it's, um, and now I'm doing research in, um, particularly in northern Pakistan, and I was brought into that research by um, a great love of my colleague um, at Sydney University who's um, worked with me now for six years and kept me sane here, I think, in many ways, um, who's from central Pakistan. And in the Muslim world, there's another sense of love um, that's around honour and duty. Mm. Um, so the, you know, but in our wider Australian world here, we have this sort of sense of Christian love which is a, a very broad kind of idea. Um, and so to sort of bring it back to language and my interest obviously in our Australian languages, including my own, I'm not quite sure how I'd say I love you in Narigo. I better figure that out if I'm going to continue mm -hmm. my wonderful loving career. Mm. Um, but um, in the language of Sydney, uh, my great friend Jacinta Tobin and I, uh, who's going to be a PhD student at Sydney, yay, she starts in March. Um, she's Daruk, speaking of Western Sydney, and um, she always says to me, Mari Nubari. Oh, sorry, I just banged my microphone, sorry, <laughs> folks. Mari Nubari, you know, but she, and she, I'm touching my heart because of that. Um, my heart, but but in the language of Sydney, um, including in this Gadigal area here. So. Um, we all, but we express this in this kind of Anglo-Christian sort of love for each other. Um, it, that's our cultural base. So we come from this English language speaking into this language which is now coming strongly back into use again. Um, so I was at the Wugalora ceremony this morning where the Sydney language word for one country is being used. So for, for me, our Australian languages, our Aboriginal languages and Torres Strait Islander languages, um, in using them, we're showing love of country. They embed you in country. They um, give you a sense of place and of people in country. Um, and so, in a sense, speaking any of our languages, for me, is an act of love. And, um, yeah. Mm. That's uh, intensely fascinating. <laughs> um, because, I, as like, in my experience, listening to some of those words, they're quite foreign. To, to myself and, and probably to the, the watch, the audience as well. Yep. Um, but we get a sense, as you said, a universal language which goes beyond words, that kind of human experience of uh, affection for one another. And you spoke to honour and duty, mm. which is something I'm resonated with me because as with William and his project and his career and what he dedicates his life to, I've also experienced that with my work with Gamarada, mm -hmm. a sense of cultural responsibility, honour. Good Sydney word, Gamarada. Honour and duty, Gamarada, right? <laughs> yeah. oh, Gamarada, yeah. um, honour and duty. Can you speak to that? Yeah, in, in um, Aboriginal Australia, in, my in all our communities, um, and including into the Pacific, it's, um, you know, I think we've always had this 
connection with all the world around us um, from here in Australia. It's, you know, we had Macassar people coming into Australia up north and, um, uh, you know, six to 10,000 years ago, I believe people came from sort of northwestern Pakistan, where I'm now doing research into this country. You know, th this has never been a completely cut off place. Um, and um, we've had all these people who've come here since. So um, as Aboriginal Australians, I think we have an honour and a duty. It's our honour and it's our duty to care for other people. It's a foundational um, connection with each other. We, um, we don't have chiefs and kings. We're not tribal in that sense. We have... Um, councils of elders, we have, um, our languages are full of this kind of language of um, deep, complicated ways of talking about human relationships that, that made a place for everybody. We didn't um, strongly gender things. We, we didn't force people into one kind of sexuality or all these sort of binaries that the English language insists on um, that have come from other cultural traditions. In our traditions and, and in our languages, it's still embodied in them that um, we, we had a connection to every single thing around us, not just living things, mm. that with the inanimate world as well. We were connected to um, every single grain of sand, mm. um, every part of the waters, salt water, fresh water. We still talk about ourselves, of course, as fresh water, salt water, um, desert mob, um, and in my case, ice mob. <laughs> so frozen country, snowy mountains, um, mm. alpine country. So we we talk about ourselves in this sort of as part of part of the world, um, and and this is something that's picked up in lots of other traditions, the other religious traditions in that came into this country. Um, I love the way our peoples um, embraced particularly Christianity was something that was brought in really early, but sort of modified the, their understanding of the stories so that, you know, people, even people like Captain Cook have a place. Everything has a place. So the stories of Captain Cook, when you go right up north in Australia, turn into these stories of, of sacrifice and um, giving of himself. It's really interesting um, in order to sort of bring his people into this world that we have here. So. You know, our, our people incorporate people and incorporate other people's stories and sense of connectedness to each other in a way that um, the English tradition really hasn't easily allowed us to keep doing. So in order to understand, I guess, love and honour and duty and connectedness in um, Aboriginal Australia and, of course, with Torres Strait Islander people as well, it's really important to understand our languages. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are great lessons for all of Australia in those um, understandings of how people fit together with country, with each other, our, our having totems, our um, moiety, marriage moieties and everything that bind us all together. There are lessons for all of the world um, in how to care for country and each other and us as part of country. Thank you. I think this, I took this, that in a different direction to what you've been no, it's, it's profound and intensely interesting. And you mentioned uh, a connection, a deep connection to everything, grains of sand, water, you know, flora, fauna, whatever. Um, it reminded me of two things. One, when I was working in Arnhem Land and I was sitting with the Yolnu and we were talking about our connection to everything, sitting under the stars on the beach, as you do, in a remote place and hearing stories. And I learned of the Duha and Yidiji, which mm. is almost like a yin and yang. Like yeah. everything is either male or female in its mm. representation and where it fits and everything right is and equally down. balanced yeah. uh, and we're connected to mm. every single thing. And I remembered another story of um, uh, when the Yidiki was uh, ha um, harvested from the, from the bush the ants that were inside of the hollow log would be sung and ceremony would take place around the ants and the water that was used. And uh, so 
an intense respect and connection to all, all, all living beings. Everything has a purpose, everything has a place, everything has responsibility to everything else. Mm. And that's and the kind, a kind of love and respect relationship, right. I think, that, yeah, is and something of us. Love and respect. And so when you begin to understand this perspective, this value system, this law system, and then you contrast it with the Western mm. value system and law system, you see how there was never going to be a happy marriage. No. Uh, and the idea of love is, has different meanings. Um, the British came in and started um, cutting down trees and the Sydney mob hugged the trees. They couldn't understand why anyone, it'd be like going in and blowing up woolies, for example, <laughs> because just for a start, trees <laughs> provide you with everything you want. Why yeah. would you destroy the whole tree yeah. and not just take what you need? So mm. it's, yeah. a, um, it's that kind a of... Culture clash. Total, yeah. And the other thing it reminded me of was um, the senior Australia, Australian of the year, Auntie Miriam Ungermeyer Bowman. Mm. So she's well known for many, many things, being an artist, being a former school principal, an elder of the, um, from the Daily River. Um, she's also known for giving us the dadadi, mm. um, which is a word that translates again to something very deep and meaningful. I think it translates to something like quiet stillness, inner contemplation, listening with more than the ears. Um, mm. And something like deep calling to deep that has a profound, holistic, multi-dimensional mm. meaning. Um, and she says that that's the gift, that that's the gift, or her gift to the nation, that mm -hmm. deep listening. Mm -hmm. Listening with more than the ears, it's a concept in itself, isn't it? Mm. Um, so thank you for that. And I feel like we've just started the conversation on that. But we need to move on to Pastor Ray, because uh, it's going to be another profound uh, conversation, I think. Um, Pastor Ray, I have a question for you too. So, and it is, how do we heal our community, uh, connect and love each other while we're living in times where there's less opportunity for personal connection? I think that's speaking to COVID, it might be speaking to digital stuff as well. And how do we, uh, how do we heal the nation? How do we love each other in this modern era and with COVID? Goodness gracious me. Yeah, we, we <laughs> saved the best one for you. We saved the hardest question for you. Look, um, I come from the other side of 1967. And so I know what it's like to live under those kind of Aboriginal protection acts and those regimes that, uh, I mean, when we was going through COVID last year, I thought, gee, was we're back on the Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Locked away and all of that stuff. So it wasn't something new for, for, for someone like myself who's experienced that. Uh, but yet, even in, the, uh, in those times, in our communities, there's what we would possibly, you could possibly call it protective love. Because we, our, our parents were always, and, and community was always there to protect the children. And uh, I know when we were uh, traveling on the road, Dad always said, Mum always said, you know, if the police picked us up, you run. Just don't let them catch you. And so when you're in those, in those situations, uh, you grow up in that trauma. It just becomes natural, normal. Uh, parts of your your story, your history, you might ask questions why in your little mind, um, but you don't have time to try to find out why. And, uh, you know, one day you're playing with your your mates there in your, in your community, and the next day they're gone. You know, you think, oh, must have gone on a holiday or something. And then years later, you catch up with them and saying, no, they were taken. And so you're dealing with these kind of separations and traumas on a, on a continuous basis. Mm. And when you're trying to find how then do you... Um, I, I don't like the word healing, actually, because I don't think there is such a thing as healing for our people. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, I've worked for almost all my life there with our stolen generations. And uh, 
even in their ways of talking about it, they don't like the word healing. Mm. And so you, we have to come up with different ways of looking at that. And even the word love is a, an alienated word for someone who has been forcibly removed. Mm. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with an issue in our community here, not of our own making. We didn't suddenly wake up and say, oh, please take my children. Mm. It's not our law. That's not our ways. But when you, you're dealing with those kinds of, uh, uh, dra uh, those kind of traumas, they're, they're, not, they're not ancient. They're not way back there on the, on the old mish. They're here with us every day of our lives. And, uh, you know, I could tell you stories after stories, but in terms of love, or my understanding of it anyways, um, the, the experiences that I've had is, 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 is a little bit different to others because uh, I've had to try to find out how do you experience love in a different way. I mean, I got it from parents and all that stuff in all my communities. But I found a different uh, perspective on love or a deeper appreciation. It's uh, what, what Jackie was talking about here. Uh, I've gone into in, this the, the, uh, spaces and places in this country here that just love you or show you what that love is. For example, when I was over in, um, amongst the Yungar people over there in Western Australia, I was down in the Jarrah Forest. If you've ever been down there, mm. it's like walking into a cathedral. Mm. But when I was in there, that's when I experienced the mystery of what we would call love, because it was just there. Mm. You, you're sitting in it, you're being part of it and your mother is trying to teach you something about what that experience is about. Mm -hmm. And then when I go from that side over here into you know, the Gippsland area here, amongst uh, our mob down this way, the Ewan Territory and down further, you sit on the beach there and you feel like this is the most safest place on the planet, mm. you know, just down past your country. Mm. You, you don't feel like you could be anywhere else but here and it's safe. And so I think love is also about being and feeling, experiencing what safety is. So how can you help others if you don't know what, what that feels like? And then when you go up into uh, uh, the northern, n northern part of, uh, uh, up in the Kimberley area there, you know, you, you, you're, 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 it's like some, some of those places, it's like walking onto, a, onto the moon, you know? But you feel that aloneness there. And that aloneness is not about being lonely. It's about experiencing something that is so dynamic about who you are and your identity and how you connect with all things again. And uh, then there's, uh, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, which is, you know, like a mother to me as well. And so wherever I've gone in this country here, I've, I've experienced my mother's love. And that's where... I'm, for me, that's why I've had to learn, or my mother has taught me what love is. And even when I was out there in, uh, you know, uh, I was out there before the dingo came to uh, Uluru there with uh, that woman, and uh, I was sitting there with the old fellows there, the old, old Uluru himself there, we're sitting at the thing there. And you're sitting here in this particular space, in this particular time, and it's not about the action of love, or the activity of love, it's just about being. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're in this particular environment where you can just be who you are. You're not being loved, you're just being love. Mm -hmm. You're a part of it. And I have had to go through those experiences to understand now how do I deal with that or how do I deal with the traumas and the tragedies that we face on a daily basis. And I can tell you some of those tragedies are quite you know, as, as we all know, quite extraordinary. And uh, I mean, I've walked into communities where you could almost cut with a knife the incredible hopelessness that's there. Mm. But you've got to learn how to love in those situations. So yeah, love is something about, for me, is, it's about being and it's receiving from our mother the kind of love that we need. Well, I 
promised that Uncle Ray would be profound in his uh, contribution to the panel, and you've delivered on that, Uncle. Thank you. And it was interesting to hear the reference, um, you know, speaking of country, being on country as our mother. Our mother is teaching us, our mother is loving us, our mother is giving us our wholeness, in a sense, um, that connection. And it made me think of this year's NADOC theme, which has just been released. So the, year for Na the theme for NADOC 2021 is Healing Country. Mm. It was released this week, announced this week. Um, and so that invites us to have another conversation about how do we heal country, how do we love country, and what, what do we get out of that? You know, what's the payoff? What, why, why are we doing this? Why do we want to do this? To mainstream Australia, many people would be asking, why do we need to heal country? You know, what does that even mean? Why is that so important? You know, where does that fit in my understanding of, you know, my role, uh, my contribution to society? How do I heal country? How do I even understand that? Um, so, um, there's another, another conversation to be had right there. Um, just in concluding our panel today, is, are, are there any, uh, any take home messages? Is there anything that you would like to share with the audience? Um, maybe a final connection to the theme of the speak out panel um, and survival day? Um, William? Yeah, look, um, it's really interesting sitting here and listening and to the other panelists and reflecting on, I guess, what some of my elders um, have taught me, particularly Auntie Mary Graham and Auntie Lilla Watson, who are some of the uh, elders I've had the privilege to be taught and had yarns with. And this idea of relationality as a society, it's what, in, what, what connects us as Aboriginal people and the relationship we have with country or land. And I just reflect on what Uncle was saying there around um, the idea of um, mother and uh, reflecting in love. And I, th I think there's something really powerful in that. Mm. I think it's something that binds us all together. I think it breaks down the fact that we are from different nations or we're from different nationalities. It, it creates this kind of connection that we all can, um, um, I guess, relate to. And for me, I was, just, I was at the march this morning over in the Domain and one of the speakers got up and said, whilst this is a time where well, Australia Day is, um, or Survival Day or well, whatever people will choose to call it, um, for Aboriginal people, it's filled with sadness, but he goes, we've got to always remember it should, should be filled with love as well, yeah. and how we can love the fact that we are yeah. in the situation we're in, and we need to find, um, we need to find happiness in that, and what we can do to reconnect and reconnect not with just with each other, but reconnect with country, and what does that then look like? Beautiful take-home message, and for the final minute we have left, I'm going to go to Pastor Ray, Uncle Ray. Any, oh, any take? Yeah. Jackie first. Yeah. Oh, I'd just like to say that the great act of love is that it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Right. Um, and our languages, please, everybody, get behind our languages mm -hmm. and love our languages. We need them. All of us need them. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Right. And to, to wrap up. <laughs> love one another. <laughs> Excellent. Mari nobody in the language of Sydney. Big love. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> And if you want to uh, view the panel again, I think people can go to the Yarvin website, uh, speak out, and um, hear it again. Um, and uh, if you're interested in the work of any of the panelists, including myself, head to that uh, head to that website, check it out. Feel free to reach out, and get in touch. Um, there'll be further speak out panels um, throughout the day. Lots of interesting stuff happening around the country for Survival Day. Um, thank you for your uh, interest and um, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Did you really good? Like, in the language of Sydney. <laughs>